I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar featuring David Goldman discussing China's global goals and alliances and why they threaten the world. We have a lot to cover and I'm excited for everyone to hear David's always brilliant insights. Thank you all for joining and for those who showed your support yesterday on Giving Tuesday for Emet and our critically important work on Capitol Hill, we greatly appreciate your faith in us. For those who have not yet made a contribution, please do consider uh, doing so at emmetonline.org as your support allows us to continue to make a difference in the direction of US foreign policy in the Middle East and beyond. Today's webinar will be recorded and the link to view and share will be sent around in the coming day or so. If you have a question for our guest, please put it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I'll try to get, as many, uh, get to as many of the questions as possible a bit later in the program. David Goldman is deputy editor of Asia Times and a Washington fellow of the Claremont Institute. He headed research groups at Bank of America, Credit Suisse and other Wall Street firms and was a partner at Reorient Group, a Hong Kong investment bank. He has consulted for the US Department of Defense and National Security Council. His most recent book is You Will Be Assimilated, China's Plan to Sinoform the World. Welcome, David. Sorry, thanks so much. It's a great honor to speak for Emmett and I can only echo what you said. Thanks to all of you listeners who support Emmett's wonder, Emmett, wonderful organization. I'm also grateful to you for that. I much appreciated for you sharing that, that sentiment, David. Um, we, we love working together with you. So I'm going to start by asking a very broad question before we get into the nitty gritty of China's global ambitions and expansionism. Is the US in a cold war with China? And if so, how did it develop? Did it begin when Nancy Pelosi decided to go to Taiwan, when China began stealing our IP many years ago, or some other time? And were US administrations asleep at the wheel and not preventing China's rise? Um, and assuming that we are in a cold war, do we need another Ronald Reagan in order to win? Well, it's a very strange kind of cold war. I'm an old cold warrior. I'm old enough to have run some minor errands at National Security Council during the Reagan administration when we defeated the evil empire of communism and democracy and free markets triumphed. Except we had virtually no trade with the Soviet Union. We shipped them some grain. Uh, there was very little contact. Very few Russians traveled to the United States. Now, we import at least $700 billion a year from China, considering our manufacturing GDP is about $2.4 trillion. The size of the impact of that on the American economy is enormous. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of Chinese students here. Um, in uh, 2019, before the COVID pandemic, 139 million Chinese traveled overseas. Many of them came to the United States as tourists or business people or whatever, and 139 million went back. Uh, Russia didn't let its citizens travel. The China's borders, except for COVID controls, of course, uh, have been open. So we have a deep and intimate economic tie with China to the point that the Secretary of Commerce yesterday said, we're, we're not trying to decouple from China. Uh, on the other hand, we are trying to contain China's technological ambitions and stop it from developing technologically as fast as it wants to. Whether we're, we can accomplish that uh, is a different question. Now, I think this began in stages. Uh, the issue of Taiwan always hangs over US-Chinese relations because the Taiwanese don't want to be governed by Beijing, but the agreement that uh, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger made with China uh, in its 1972 Shanghai communique says that there is one China, Taiwan and China both think they're part of one China and they'll work it out on their own. So we specifically stayed away from the issue of Taiwanese sovereignty, which for the Chinese is a tripwire. I think the Chinese contributed to the worsening of relations in a big way by aggressive actions in the South China Sea, taking disputed islands and turning them into military bases, uh, which frightened everybody. Uh, but there's been no exchange of fire between the United States and China. China hasn't invaded anyone. Uh, since you know, Tibet, really, in the 1950s. There was a brief war with Vietnam in 1979. So uh, 
unlike the issue of the Soviet Union, where we had insurrections all over the third world sponsored by Soviet subversion, and we were in firefights with them uh, directly or through proxies. Uh, this is a very cold war in the sense that no guns are going off. So it's an entirely new situation. I don't know how to compare it to anything in the past. There has been nothing like China or China's rise uh, in modern history. So I think we have to take it fresh and, and be careful about references to, uh, 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 to previous situations. And as far as getting Ronald Reagan back, uh, most of our problems would be solved by having another Ronald Reagan. But that's a long story. <laughs> That, that, I, I love that way of looking at things. And I think we're all waiting for that next one. So um, that was that was very insightful. And we will talk about Taiwan in a little while. Um, but staying on this theme for just one minute, the Wall Street Journal described Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's meeting with his Chinese counterpart in Cambodia as a falling of relations on the heels of President Biden's first meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping in Bali. Um, and Lord knows what Xi's real takeaway from that meeting was. But do, do you agree that there is a, a thawing to the extent that we are in a Cold War? I mean, it seems to me that China is going to be a challenge for many years and decades uh, to come. So what exactly does a thaw even mean? Well, I don't think thaw is the right word. I think there is a sense of reality hitting uh, uh, as far as the Pentagon is concerned. I just read uh, uh, yesterday the new uh, China uh, military evaluation the Pentagon published this week, and I read it side by side with commentaries in the Chinese media about the state of the Chinese military. China has, China spends about a third of what we do on defense, but in real terms, uh, it's closer to parity. For one thing, uh, the costs of hiring soldiers or building weapons in China is much lower than that in the United States. Uh, and secondly, whereas we have an enormously diffuse defense budget, we have uh, most of our costs as personnel, the Chinese have massively concentrated their defense spending on coastal defense. They've got 2,000 modern uh, surface-to-ship missiles uh, by most estimates. And these are missiles which take off like ballistic missiles, but they're guided by satellite information at the end uh, when I consulted for Defense Department for Office of Net Assessment uh, nearly 10 years ago, the view there was that China at the time had missiles that could destroy American aircraft carriers, cut through the layered defenses by swapping them with very large numbers and very good guidance. And since then, reading the Pentagon report, Chinese have invested massively in satellites with uh, coordinated radar of several different types, types as well as electromagnetic sensors. So their ability to hit a moving ship under maneuvers uh, is probably pretty good. They have uh, 800 fourth generation aircraft, maybe 200 fifth generation aircraft on their coasts. They have long range <clears throat> missiles that can destroy our bases in Guam and Okinawa. They have a very large number of uh, diesel electric submarines that make about as much noise as turning on a light bulb. So if we were to get, God forbid, into a war with China in the Taiwan Strait, we don't know what would happen. I'm not gonna say I know, but there is a very high probability we would lose it in a very big way. Uh, Elbridge Colby, uh, famous you know, writer of a uh, book called Strategy of the Nile, former Trump Defense Department official, whom I've debated a couple of times, and with whom I've, I've disagreed on many things, tweeted the other day that senior U.S. flag officers are saying we are on a trajectory, and I quote, to be to get crushed by China in a war in the Taiwan Strait. So I think our evaluation of the progress that China has made, we could talk about this all day, is such that the military is acting as a voice of moderation saying, guys, we do not want to get in a war with China. So let's put in safeguards, let's set up guardrails, let's have consultation and make sure we don't get into a war. I think that was uh, President Biden's objective. I think uh, as far as that is concerned, the meeting went well on both sides. It doesn't make relations with China any better, but it does mean 
that neither side really is in a mood for a kinetic situation, that is for guns going off. So let's let's stay on the military issue for a second, uh, since you've raised it. It's 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 clear that China's military is growing more powerful, and as you say, they have advantages in surface-to-air missiles, hypersonic weapons, aircraft, submarines, five G communications technology, um, and other technological advancements. While the U.S. military is in decline, you've said that you warned the Defense Department that we get crushed in any war with China. And earlier this month, the commander of the U.S. Strategic Command, Admiral Charles. Richard stated that when it comes to America's ability to deter China, the ship is slowly sinking. And summing up America's position vis-a-vis -vis China, the former head for military intelligence in Indo-Pacific Command simply commented that the US is quote, too late, too late in realizing the mortal danger, too late in preparedness, too late in uniting all possible forces for resistance. So in your view, is it in fact too late? And do you believe that the Biden administration and the Pentagon understand the urgency of rebuilding our military and competing with China's expansionism? Oh, I, I don't think the Biden administration has any serious commitment to rebuilding our military. But there's a serious question as to what that uh, entails, Lori. For example, China is clearly ahead of us in one critical military system. That's called hypervelocity glide missiles. These are missiles uh, that tra travel at the velocity of an intercontinental ballistic missiles, many several times the speed of sound, but they can also hug the ground and swirl around to make them hard to find. Uh, and they travel so fast that any anti-missile system we currently have can't catch them, but because by the time you, can't, you see them on the radar and you shoot a missile at it, they've moved too fast for the anti-missile missile to catch up with it. These can be used to deliver nuclear weapons. They could be used to attack aircraft carriers. Uh, the Russians actually pioneer the technology. They've used a couple of these in Ukraine as a demonstration. The Chinese have tested them successfully. Our tests have been uh, mixed at best. We have a 50% failure rate. So we're clearly behind them. Now, what would it take to stop this kind of thing? Uh, an anti-missile missile is just too slow by the laws of physics to catch up. A beam of light, of course, travels much faster than any missile. So I think the future of anti-missile defense is in uh, high energy uh, weapons, lasers, and similar technology. As you know, the Israelis have the iron beam, which is uh, supposed to be effective against uh, drones, uh, mortars, uh, uh, cannon, artillery, and other things. So the technology is in theory there, but it would be a massive effort and a non-trivial uh, problem to be able to target uh, hypervelocity glide vehicles for this. So I think that where we have really dropped the ball, uh, and going back to Reagan, uh, we spent under Reagan the equivalent of about $300 billion a year on development of weapons and related systems. That was more than 1% of GDP. Now it's about a third of that relative to GDP. So uh, the Reagan administration, if we're talking about what we did back then, would be spending another you know, trillion dollars over the next four or five years in high-tech defense R&D to try to answer these Chinese challenges. Uh, I don't think that building more aircraft carriers or destroyers or weapon, legacy weapon systems, more F-35s, is going to improve our position very much. And the typical way the Pentagon thinks about things is you ask them what to do, they say, well, just give us more of what we have. Uh, with uh, Harold Brown and uh, Cap Weinberger, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, we had visionary defense secretaries who led a high-tech driver, which totally transformed warfare, gave us absolute superiority over the Soviet Union, uh, and won the Cold War. That kind of strategic vision is sadly lacking. And although you know, I, I voted for Donald Trump twice and many times defended him in print against what I thought were scurrilous attacks, uh, the Trump Defense Department didn't do very much in this direction either. So we've lost 
a lot of ground at a lot of time. Doesn't mean we can't catch up, but I think the uh, military leaders whom you quoted are right to say that in terms of deterring China in the Taiwan Straits, uh, we probably missed the boat. Okay, so that's a that's a good lead into my next question, and and well, you know, the eight hundred pound gorilla in the room is always if and when China is going to invade Taiwan, and you touched on this a couple minutes ago as well. Biden left his meeting with Xi believing that there was no imminent plans to do so, but Biden hasn't exactly garnered Americans' trust when it comes to judging our enemies, whether it's the Taliban, the mullahs, or even Putin. Um, and both sides are warning each other to not interfere in the Taiwan Straits. Uh, Walter Russell Mead stated in a recent Wall Street Journal op-ed, quote, the risk to peace in Asia is not that Taiwan will trigger a crisis by challenging Beijing. It is that China sensing American weakness will launch an opportunistic attack across the strait. He added, quote, alienated from the mainland, but deeply fearful of war, Taiwan's population keeps a close eye on Washington's mood. Few in Taiwan believe that the island could defend itself without American support. And if the Taiwanese believe that the US doesn't have their back, the pressure to find some accommodation with the mainland will steadily grow. And then me concluded, a war in Taiwan would be a humanitarian disaster. Unification on Chinese terms would be a strategic catastrophe, endangering the security of our allies and of the US itself. So I have two questions on this. The US has kept the peace in the Taiwan Strait since 1949. Do you think we can continue to do so? It sounds like you do not think that we can continue to do so based on your last comment, but if you can just elaborate a little bit on that, especially given you know, the military disadvantages that we've discussed and the Wall Street Journal reported yesterday that Beijing's military expansionism is putting it on track to, to actually prevent us from interfering in a crisis with Taiwan. Um, and do you see the Taiwanese making an accommodation with China given the lessons learned from China's repression in Hong Kong? Well, you know, there are 2 million Taiwanese now working on the mainland out of a population of 24 million, working population of about 12, 14 million. So one out of every six or seven working age Taiwanese is working on the mainland. Taiwan is one of the largest investors in the mainland with about $200 billion of foreign direct investment. Uh, China's chip fabrication plants are being built by Taiwanese chip engineers. They pay them double salary, and get them over to help them. So you can say that China, in a sense, is getting everything that it really wants from Taiwan already, and that Taiwan is indeed accommodating China in the areas which are most important to China. Um, nowhere in its history has China taken military action when it thinks it can win by patience what it would cost a great deal to win by war. And as things stand, I think that uh, as China develops a stronger and stronger position around the Taiwan Straits, Taiwan will continue to accommodate China, which it has all along. Uh, the elections last week for uh, the six major municipalities were a resounding victory for the KMT. The KMT is the old Shanghai Czech party led by his great grandson. Uh, the DPP, which is more anti-Beijing and shades towards uh, independent sentiment, lost its leader, resigned. So uh, my sense is that uh, the Taiwanese uh, do not want to fight and they will accommodate economically. The Chinese, as long as they believe that Taiwan will fall into their lap without a fight, eventually will not take military action because the economic cost of military action would be staggering. Uh, were China to uh, conduct an unprovoked attack on Taiwan, uh, despite the economic cost to us, we would react uh, very harshly. And that would have terrible consequences for the Chinese economy and for the power base of the Chinese Communist Party. So I think it is possible to kick the can down the road. Uh, what Biden said is we're not going to push for Taiwanese sovereignty. Uh, you guys don't invade. Uh, and that situation can continue for quite some time. Long term, one of the key facts about Taiwan is that it has uh, the fastest rate of aging and the lowest birth rate of any country in the world, maybe except South Korea. 
So its workforce of on UN projections falls from oh, about 14 million to 3 million adults in the course of the century. At some point, it ceased to be economically viable, and it will have to, in some way, merge with the mainland. The, the uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party is counting on this. So I think status quo, kicking the can down the road, is achievable. It's the best we can do at the moment barring something unforeseen. And in the meantime, uh, we should, although we aren't at the moment, we should adopt the Reagan approach of a tech driver to transform uh, our military posture and deal with an entirely different kind of warfare, uh, uh, which is emerging in the 21st century. It's, it's very interesting. Um, so I, I know a topic, um, I want to raise a topic that I know is um, something you've been focused on of late. The, the past summer, you co-wrote a column entitled U.S.-China AI Rivalry, A Tale of Two Talents. You began by stating, quote, much has been written about China's numerical advantage in science and engineering. China awarded 1.38 million engineering bachelor's degrees in 2020. The comparable American number is 197,000, or just one-seventh of China's total. And you stated, China is pulling ahead of the United States in AI, the definitive technology of the economic revolution now underway, because it directs its top talent toward the frontier of science, while America's brightest graduates chase the low-hanging fruit of internet applications. Can you discuss this issue and why it's important? And is, again, is it too late to rectify? Well, it's never too late if we, as Americans, decide that we really need to do something. Uh, we've surprised the world uh, many times, but the major American defense contractors uh, can't hire the top talent out of Stanford, MIT, and Harvard, and so forth. Google and Facebook and Microsoft hire them, and they pay them much more than defense contractors. So con defense contractors tend to get uh, people from second-tier schools, and for the most part, they're uh, programming capability is four or five generations behind where the top uh, tech firms are. We, we concentrate our resources in consumer software, video games, uh, social media, and so forth. The Chinese do it in hardware. In China, uh, the government uh, made sure that the Alibabas and the Baidus and Tencents, the equivalent of our big tech companies, did not have the wherewithal to dominate the job market. They came down to them pretty hard in an anti-monopoly campaign over the last several years, which crushed their stock prices and was, of course, widely commented upon in the press. Jack Ma, the, uh, the Jeff Bezos, if you will, of China, turns out to have been living in virtual exile in Tokyo for the past year. On the other hand, they pay top dollar for their brightest graduates to spend at least a number of years in the military aerospace industry. So China has done a much better job than we have of channeling its top talent into national security and defense applications. On our side, you may recall about five years ago, there was a strike by Google software developers after Google agreed to use artificial intelligence applications to help the Pentagon analyze a reconnaissance photos. It's an obvious thing to do. And the Google kids said, we're not going to do things that kill people because we're peaceful bourgeois bohemians who you know, just want to program uh, avatars and the metaverse and you know, what, what, whatever it is that they do. Um, and that created quite a scandal. Uh, Google eventually rectified the situation, but the attitude of uh, the uh, the bourgeois hippie attitude that prevails in our best schools has led to a general hostility towards military applications. So the Pentagon is going to hire people from the University of Iowa. Uh, the other basic problem we have, we simply don't have enough kids qualified to go into engineering programs, given the misery of our K through 12. If you look at the top state universities, uh, University of Oregon, University of Washington, University of Iowa, Arizona, and so forth. They have good engineering programs, but their acceptance rates are between 80 and 90%. They'll take anyone who can walk in on their, you know, who's still breathing and can add and subtract. 
and they have 50% dropout rates. So we simply don't have enough Americans. If you want to run a tent project in the United States, and I've been involved in many, you can't do it without hiring Chinese. And that creates a, a problem for the defense industry. If the best engineers out there, software people are Chinese, and you know, there are a lot of Indians, but the Chinese are the largest group, uh, then you've got a security problem for the defense industry. So we have a lot of wood to chop there. Um, yeah, I, I, it's interesting because the, um, my, my kids, when they were in college and they were taking finance classes and they were taking math classes that were required, the, the teachers were all Chinese and they struggled to even understand them. I, they would send me videos, but that, but in speaking to the head of the math departments, it, apparently this is across campuses across the U.S. is that it's the Chinese that are teaching the, the STEM related courses. Um, and we we definitely have, um, you know, we're, our numbers of Americans that are capable of doing that are decreasing, as you point out. So it's frightening. Yes, um, this is why I believe that Randy Weingarten is a bigger threat to American national security than Xi Jinping. Yeah, you you and, and Elon Musk. And Mike Pompeo. Oh, was it Mike Pompeo? OK, but I, yes. maybe Elon Musk retweeted that Maybe he did. all the great all the great minds are in agreement on that <laughs> um I, okay so i want to touch on china's relationship in the middle east or relationships in the middle east in a 2020 article which you called pax Sinica in the middle east revisited you wrote china doesn't have a middle east policy it has a global policy and the prospect of a deal with iran is a move on a global game board in response to american efforts to hinder china's breakout as a technological superpower you added, China is drawn into the Middle East for national security reasons, for the same reason that Russia was drawn into Syria in 2015. Can you discuss China's alliances in the Middle East, the development of a Pax Seneca, and where it all stands today? In particular, building upon your evolving vision of this Pax Seneca, is China, through its influence over Iran and Russia, emerging as the new strong horse in the region? And I know there's a lot here, but also if you can touch on Xi's planned visit to Saudi Arabia and how that ties into this, this whole context. Well, the Ukraine war changed the situation in an important way. It put Turkey in the center. Uh, Turkey has more than doubled its imports from China in the past uh, year or two, and it's quadrupled its exports to Russia. These are clearly related. Turkey is now the intermediary taking in Chinese goods, evading sanctions, and shipping them to Russia. So, by the way, is Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia, and other, um, uh, and, and other countries in the region. Turkey nearly went bankrupt a couple of years ago. Uh, its currency collapsed. Uh, its inflation rate went to 80%. And the Chinese basically bailed them out. They gave them massive amounts of trade credits, which is why their trade to uh, Turkey exploded. This is extremely important for China for several reasons, one of which is because China's Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and China has uh, oppressed um, harshly, uh, are basically Turkish speaking Chinese. The Turkish cultural influence is enormous and Turkey traditionally was the protectors of the Uyghurs. So China is keeping its friends close and its enemies closer by locking uh, Turkey into its economic machine and making Russia, of course, more dependent on it as well. Iran remains an enormous question mark. Obviously, the Russians have been doing a great deal with Iran in terms of military technology and elsewhere. The Chinese, a couple of years ago, signed a deal on paper <coughs> uh, projecting hundreds of billions of dollars of Chinese investment in Iran. Not a great deal has happened. Yeah, China's uh, oil imports from Iran still remain extremely low. They cheat a bit and send some Iranian oil through Malaysia and claim it's Malaysian oil. But uh, we haven't seen a major change in Chinese-Iranian relations. It's more concentrated on Central Asia with Turkey as the focus. I think China is going to be opt opportunistic and cautious. It doesn't have a fundamental strategic interest in the Middle East. It could use Iran to harass the United States if we got into a really nasty fight with them. But China has been trying to avoid the appearance 
uh, provoking the United States. So they've been very cautious about Iran. As far as Saudi is concerned, China's two largest sources of oil are Saudi Arabia and Russia. They're now roughly equal. China is an enormous military supplier to Saudi Arabia, and its core economic interest is to keep oil prices relatively low and prevent a war in the Persian Gulf. If, for example, there were to be a war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which has been talked about for years, which disrupted oil production, China would be a major economic loser. So from Israel's standpoint, uh, China's presence in the region is not a good thing, but it's not an unmixed blessing because uh, the one thing, unlike Russia, which would make money if Iran blew up Saudi Arabia, oil prices would go up, it would get more market share. China would be a huge loser if Iran were to start a war. So to the extent China has influence in the region, it would probably be to uh, uh, try to dampen the possibility of a war. So nothing is black and white. Uh, China has no friends. Uh, it's traditionally taken an anti-Israel position, a third worldist view at the United Nations. I've, I've visited China with Israeli delegations who complain bitterly to the Chinese that they never even so much as abstain an anti-Israel resolution. They vote to support them all. The Chinese will say, look, there's 60 Muslim embassies here and one Jewish embassy, you know, it's just in our interest. But I've also heard Chinese diplomats say in private that now that Israel has peace treaties with all its Arab neighbors, uh, they don't they consider the Israeli Arab problem to be a thing of the past. China's are opportunistic, hypocritical, and uh, self-interested. So we'll see that they will respond to events and adjust their policy to benefit themselves. Sometimes it will hurt us. <clears throat> in other situations, it won't hurt us. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to elaborate a little bit more, if you could, on China's relationship with Israel. Um, you, in the same article that I referenced uh, just a, a moment ago, you raised Israel's concerns and stated that the prospect of Iran as a Chinese dependent worries Israel, as it should. China might help Iran build out its nuclear program. Even if China wants stability and the free flow of oil, fanatics in Tehran might exploit this to achieve a nuclear weapons breakout. It is also possible that Chinese influence in Iran keep the fanatics at bay, but Israel cannot count on a benign outcome. So again, can you just elaborate a little bit more, especially in light of the recent IAEA disclosures on Iran's breakout time being near zero? And um, if you have any thoughts on likely next steps for Israel and the implications for her relationship with China? China certainly had a great deal to do with uh, Iran's nuclear program. It created the Pakistani nuclear program it aided the North Korean nuclear program, and we know with uh, absolute certainty that Iran got help from North Korea, perhaps also from Pakistan, in its nuclear program. So indirectly, China has contributed to the Iran nuclear problem, and I see no sense of urgency or worry in China about Iran getting nuclear weapons. Quite the contrary, I think that they think this is good for the, a multipolar world that diminishes American uh, influence in the world and gives the you know, gives America more problems to deal with. If you ask the Chinese about the possibility of Iran conducting a nuclear attack against Israel, they'll say, oh, well, Israel has nuclear weapons too, so we're not worried about that. That's not going to happen. That's just a balance of power situation, which I think is very naive on their part. Um, anything that enhances Iran's military technological capability as long as this evil theocracy is in place is, in my view, a bad thing. But I don't think the Chinese see it that way at all. So there's an enormous risk that Chinese investment <clears throat> in Iran would give them the capability to build more military systems like the cheap and sadly effective drones that they've provided to Russia for the Ukraine war. Uh, now these drones cost a few thousand dollars each. You can launch hundreds of them. Uh, how effective they would be against Israeli air defenses, 
uh, at this point, I, I don't know. These are military secrets, technological questions I'm not privy to, but obviously it's a worry. Thank you. Um, Karen, uh, Kevin Warsh, a former member of the Federal Reserve, wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in which he raised the concern that China's new launch of a digital version of the Chinese yuan threatens the dominance of the US dollar and American hegemony. Um, he stated, quote, absent leadership by the US authorities in China with a decidedly different view of the public good are trying to use the new technology to erode America's global standing. The Fed and Treasury should cease to play the slow game while China builds a new digital monetary and financial architecture. America's other big trading partners won't wait around while US authorities consider incremental reforms. The status quo is neither, neither satisfactory nor sustainable. How serious of a problem is this? And again, do you believe the current US government understands this threat and is equipped to address it? Well, the Chinese would love uh, the RMB to play a bigger role and challenge the dollar as a reserve and trading currency. Uh, that's not going to happen in a broad scale anytime soon for a simple reason. You've got exchange controls in China. If you make money in a business in China, you have to go ask the central bank for permission to take them out. A lot of Western businesses simply reinvest their profits in China because it's difficult to take money out. Why would you trade or hold reserves in a currency? that you can't use freely. The pound sterling as the reserve currency of the 19th century, uh, early part of the 20th, the dollar as a reserve currency were supported by free, open, and efficient capital markets. China's capital markets uh, have expanded enormously, but in terms of liquidity and efficiency, they're absolutely a dog's breakfast. So until China is willing to make the RMB convertible, allow free flows, um, and until they are willing to crack down on corruption, fraud, and opacity in their capital markets, uh, the use of the RMB as a reserve instrument is going to be limited. And I don't care how many gadgets you attach to a digital schmidgel, that's not going to make that much of a difference. Um, that said, the weaponization of the dollar in the course of the Ukraine war, the seizure of hundreds of billions of dollars of Russian reserves has led to the uh, contingency or emergency adoption of RMB payments in a very big way. So the Russians, for example, are now trading oil in RMB. Uh, the Indians are also trading oil in Indian rupee. Uh, the use of non-dollar currencies uh, and not just the RMB was given enormous impetus as a way of getting around sanctions or prospective sanctions. If you're the Saudis and you like going around the world uh, butchering journalists you don't like in foreign embassies or you know, whatever the Saudis are alleged to have done, and you're worried that someone is going to seize your reserves because of human rights violations, you probably want to own more RMB, more gold, more things that aren't the US dollar. So I think we have to distinguish between the response to American sanctions, which were harsh and maybe deserved, but unprecedented, which frightened a lot of people and drove them into non-dollar currencies and the underlying economics. The Chinese capital markets are very far away from being able to support a major reserve currency. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of questions in the queue, but before we get to those, I just want to ask you one final question. I'm sure everybody's wondering what your thoughts are on the current protests uh, throughout China. Um, you know, <laughs> well, but some people are comparing, saying, you know, this is going to lead to the next Tiananmen Square. Some people are saying, you know, this is going to threaten Xi's dynasty, you know, having just been elected basically for life. Where, where do you think these are going to go? Are they going to have any long-term implications? Are they going to die down? Well, are they going to be repressed? It, it depends what the government does. The, I, I've written on many occasions that the one really catastrophic plunder Xi Jinping and his government made was the zero COVID policy and the massive lockdowns. Back in 2020, when you had much slower transmitting strains of the virus, uh, the Chinese used uh, a lot of uh, information gathering and artificial intelligence systems to project 
uh, future outbreaks and preemptive testing and rolling lockdowns. They use that very effectively. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, was writing articles at the time talking about China's uh, uh, COVID control policy as a triumph of artificial intelligence and proof that Chinese were ahead of us. They got complacent. Uh, they also stuck to their lousy Sinovac vaccine, which is you know, pretty much completely useless. Come 2022, we have the Omicron strain, which is less deadly, but far more transmissible. And this completely swamped the Chinese systems. They were very slow to react, and they reacted just by shutting everybody down. And they also did it, particularly at the local level, in arbitrary, harsh, and sometimes very brutal ways. So people of China really had enough and stood up to the government and said, this is unacceptable. We're not going to take it anymore. So I think the government will adapt to the protests. They will gradually remove the lockdowns. Uh, I believe they'll import hundreds of millions of doses of mRNA vaccines and uh, do essentially what they did in Hong Kong, which is vaccinate 80% of their population with effective modern vaccines. Uh, and they'll respond to the protests. And Xi Jinping, who is the master of putting himself in front of the parade, that's how he got into power, that's how he has stayed in power, will represent himself as the benevolent emperor who listens to the voice of the people uh, and try to ride the wave of popular resentment. Now, of course, whether he succeeds or not, I don't know, but I think the courage and discipline and intelligence that the student demonstrator showed at Tsinghua University and elsewhere is admirable and it's stirring and heartwarming to see. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna turn now to the Q&A. There's quite a few questions. Uh, someone asked, doesn't it look like China is following the same script that happened with Japan in the 1980s in terms of their economy? Doesn't it look like their housing depression will take down their economy and therefore take down their world domination efforts? Yeah, you know, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, the housing situation is, uh, is, is a special case. Remember, China moved 700 million people from countryside to city in 40 years. Biggest migration in history. That's two, more than two Americas. To do that, they had to build the equivalent of twice the housing in America. All of Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals. That's why housing became 25% of GDP and why property investment is 70% of the net worth of Chinese households and land sales are the main source of income for local governments. Now that migration has largely been accomplished. It's still happening, but at a much slower rate, it's tapering off. So turning that aircraft, that ocean liner around, is an enormous job. And with this incredible boom in land prices that came off this great migration, which of course the source of China's in spectacular economic growth for the past 40 years, uh, is a, a, a enormous amount of corruption, book fiddling, bribes and so forth, and a nasty relationship between China's 40,000 property developers and its local governments. Uh, off the record, what the Asia Times hears from Chinese officials is there are 40,000 developers in China and 38,000 of them are going to go bankrupt and a lot of local officials are going to go to jail. Um, but I think a country with a 40% national savings rate and several trillion dollars worth of foreign exchange reserves and an inflation rate of 2%, uh, uh, government debt to GDP ratio of 70% as opposed to 130% in the United States has a lot of flexibility. So I don't think the housing crisis takes them down. Japan is a very different situation. Uh, there are similarities. All the Asian development models, uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, um, and of course, China, are descendants of the Meiji Restoration of 1868. The, that there is an Asian model, which they all adopted. But one enormous difference with Japan is that Japan made an intentional decision to preserve its farmers and its middle class. It wanted to do so both for economic, but above all for cultural and political reasons. 
China, on the other hand, tore out the old economy by the grass roots and uh, transformed everything. So China's single-minded goal at the moment is to be the leader in so-called fourth industrial revolution technologies. It wants a great leap in productivity through the digitizing of industry. If you go on YouTube, uh, uh, Asia Times did a webinar on Monday um, uh, with several industrial automation specialists from the US, Europe, and China. The Chinese was the head of the mining division at Huawei. Uh, what he had to say stunned me, and I encourage you to watch it. It basically said, as we've created, we're going to be the Microsoft of uh, digital industry. We're creating the operating system, which allows you to plug and play in all the different, all the different applications on an enterprise level, so they all talk to each other. So China's doing some really remarkable things in industrial automation, artificial intelligence applications. I don't know if they'll succeed but I wouldn't say uh, ex ante that we know they won't. And if they do, uh, we're gonna be in very serious trouble. Thank you. Um, uh, so a, a question from Claire Lopez. Claire, you always, you always submit Hi, very Claire. intelligent, Claire. wonderful questions. Um, so Claire asked, uh, challenging as these military, economic, trade, and technological issues are with regard to China, it seems to me that even more serious challenges are how the CCP has infiltrated and co-opted every single American sector of society per Peter Schweitzer's elite capture. What can we, should we, are we doing about this? Well, we made a decision to let the Chinese take over hardware well, we made money on software. After the 2000 uh, dot-com crash, uh, most of the American tech companies who were then making hardware, Cisco is a great example, they used to make internet routers, figured out that their return on equity in their software divisions was 20, 30, 40%, and their return on equity in their hardware divisions was five, 10, 15%. So better to let the Chinese subsidize those things, provide the cheap hardware that would allow Americans to spend money on Netflix and Amazon and Facebook and so forth. Uh, that uh, won over, it basically created a symbiosis between the American tech industry and uh, uh, a Chinese industry. Uh, people called that uh, Chimerica. There was a book by Neil Ferguson um, uh, on that, uh, that title. Uh, I think there is some buyer's remorse. Uh, Eric Schmidt, for example, who used to be CEO of Google, one of the great beneficiaries of this, though Google did get kicked out of China. Uh, Schmidt runs something called the National Commission on Artificial Intelligence, and its September report said we have to stop China's technological ambitions, so stop selling them high-end chips and so forth, which is exactly what the Biden administration proposed to do. Uh, I think we have to restore American high-tech manufacturing so that this, uh, and break this symbiosis and return the industries that we let slip and that China has taken over to the United States. That's easier said than done. That Belling that cat is not going to be simple. It will involve many elements of tax, regulatory, and industrial policy. Uh, but I think we have to transform the incentives. Otherwise, uh, people who can make more money in China, like Elon Musk, will go to China. I mean, Elon Musk is the richest guy in the world and one of the most influential. He's not just a great capitalist, he's an influencer. Uh, Musk is there because a guy named Li Chang, who was party boss in Shanghai, moved heaven and earth to build a Tesla plant in Shanghai that could produce 350,000 units a year. Now, Li Chang is now the premier of China. He's Xi Jinping's number two guy. So as long as the Chinese can make people gazillionaires by giving them access to their industrial machine, they're going to have a lot of influence. So someone asked, else asked a question that I think is appropriate for me to raise now. Is there anything being done to limit U.S. investment firms like BlackRock and now you know, Tesla from investing billions into China? Nope. Uh, the Trump trade deal with China 
demanded that China open its domestic financial markets to American financial services. And that's one of the things that we asked them for. And the Chinese did it. Uh, they, they're very happy to have the Black Rocks and the Goldman Sachs and so forth uh, for a simple reason. One is uh, American firms bring expertise, which uh, the Chinese domestic market doesn't have. And secondly, it gives them a lot of uh, political sympathy in the United States. Uh, so nothing's being done. And to change that would require you know, uh, a, a change in attitude on our part. Uh, whether BlackRock runs a mutual fund in China, worries, as opposed to a Chinese firm, let's say <coughs> China Life, worries me a lot less than uh, the fact that the Chinese have fully automated factories, warehouses, and ports that are way ahead of us in many uh, real economy uh, uh, AI applications that produce and move goods. So I'll stay sort of on the economic investment end of things, but move to a question about that with regard to Israel. Israel has major Chinese investments ranging from the major dairy company, uh, uh, Tanuva through building and operating Israeli seaports to construction of light underground in Tel Aviv. As such, do you think Israel has acted unwisely in permitting the Chinese to involve themselves in operating um, vital infrastructure? Well, the infrastructure, I'm not I really don't know enough about it to be able to say how worried I am. Uh, I, I've heard the view that, and the Haifa port the Chinese built, a very modern port, uh, highly automated, very efficient, uh, certainly helpful for Israel. Uh, and I've heard it argued that uh, somebody with a pair of binoculars on a department building balcony in, uh, in Haifa overlooking the port can get as much information about what's happening there as the Chinese port operators. The real tricky issue is technology and artificial intelligence. I don't think anyone really cares if um, the Israelis ship uh, water management technology to China, anti-pollution devices and things like that. The issue much more is artificial intelligence where Israel is a world leader because artificial intelligence is a technology uh, with a dual use that is civilian as well as military. So from the American standpoint, the cooperation of uh, Israel with China in artificial intelligence research and development is a concern. I don't know what the right answer is. Uh, I, I worry that we're in a situation such as Jeremiah described between Babylon and Egypt. China may be a dominant power in the Middle East at some point. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, Israel is a small country. It needs to have good relations with all the powers in the region. Turkey has an abominable government, but Israel just exchanged ambassadors with Turkey for the first time since the recognition of Jerusalem by the United States. Uh, I think that's a good thing. Israel needs good relations with Turkey, just as it needs good relations with Russia to be able to deal with uh, airspace in Syria and suppress Iranian-backed uh, militias and Iranian military installations. So I think Israel is a very fine line to walk to maintain cordial relations with China. I don't think Israel should make an enemy of China, but at the same time, it's an ally of the United States and it has to be extremely careful in providing technology to China, which might have a military application. Exactly how that should be done is above my pay grade. It's a difficult problem. And I hope uh, uh, Netanyahu can find a good solution to it. I'm glad I don't have that job. <laughs> uh, do the Chinese people have a strong sense of nationalist pride and accept their government for that reason? What would it take to overthrow the government uh, either by the people or by the ruling elite? Is there any chance of the Chinese government evolving into less authoritarian? Uh, China it really, doesn't resemble a nation in the Western sense at all. Uh, if someone from Beijing goes out to uh, Chengdu, a city of 50, 30 million people in uh, Sichuan province, um, where they make most of their uh, military aircraft, 
he won't understand a word from the local. Sichuanese as is different from um, uh, Mandarin as is Portuguese from German. And if you go to Cant uh, Guangdong, the Cant Cantonese and the Mandarin speakers can't understand a word each other say. Uh, there are 200 dialects spoken in China and by the government's estimate, only about 30% of Chinese will typically have a conversation in Mandarin. Most of them know some Mandarin because they learned in school, but they, they speak their own dialect. Uh, China is an empire that assimilated many peoples. They're not the Romulans, they're the Borg. So Chinese nationalism is not a concept which you can transfer from the Western idea of nationalism. There's a pride and loyalty to China the way China have, Chinese uh, dynasties have always broken up, always broken up, almost always, is uh, you have a breakaway province which rebels against the center, aided by a foreign invader. That's why they are paranoid in the extreme about Taiwan. It's not simply Taiwan's 24 million people. It's that if Taiwan can break away, the 170 million people of Guangdong, the Cantonese, who speak a different language, uh, have a very different culture and wonder why they should pay taxes to the emperor in Beijing might get the same idea and the same in Sichuan or so forth. 1.4 billion people contains many different nations and clans and tribes within it. So uh, I think the overthrow of the government would be associated with some kind of major economic disaster, natural or otherwise. Uh, now, this is the first time in Chinese history where no Chinese need worry about going hungry, about starvation. That's, that's a very big change. So natural disasters probably would not have the impact they had in the past, but uh, were China to undergo a major economic decline, yes, I think the Communist Party would be in very big trouble. The deal the Chinese Communist Party has made with the people is we, we tell you to keep your mouth shut and tell you what to do, at least as far as politics is concerned, in return for which you can make a decent amount of money and pursue your own private life without being uh, interfered with too much. But if that deal disappears, yes, I think Communist Party rule would be at risk. Um, so we have a lot of questions. I'm going to just do one more because we're running out of time. And I, I find this... A, a kind of an ironic question. Is the quality of the Chinese vaccine a more reliable litmus test of their highly touted military, technological, and economic strength than the opinions of the experts? I mean, it seems to me that there's a differential between their medical advancements and their military, but I leave that to you to... Well, they're all over the map. Uh, as the fellow from Huawei said at our uh, uh, industry webinar on Monday, uh, we're talking about a fourth industrial revolution technologies, but most Chinese factories are barely at uh, the second industrial revolution level. There's an enormous spread. If they, there are some technologies which uh, they've pioneered, for example, uh, quantum communications. They're definitely the world's leader. They put, uh, they put a, a landing module on the dark side of the moon, first people ever to do that. Uh, their hypersonic weapons are spectacularly good. So there's an enormous mix and an enormous range. Uh, and I don't think there's anything you can point to that's typical of China. This is a country which, remember, 50 years ago had a per capita GDP, 40 years ago, of $200 a year. People barely had enough to eat. Uh, tens of millions of people died of starvation in the 1950s in the Great Leap Forward. It was a primitive country. Now, <clears throat> You see some parts which are still pretty poor, but you also see great cities which make New York City look like a village. Um, so it's a, China is in transformation and you can't put your finger on one thing and say, well, that kind of sums it up because there are just too many moving targets. Um, so David, if you can hold up your book for everybody to see, I, you can order oh, David's book on, on yes, Amazon. Um, and I think it's it, 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 brilliant insights as always, David, I really appreciate you joining oh, Lord, us thank, today. Thanks you were, so much you were for wonderful. Words. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be part of an Emmet Center webinar. Thanks to you. Thanks to all the participants. Thank you. And thank you again to everybody who's watching and we look forward to seeing you next week.
Have a good afternoon.